Hey, 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 potheads and political junkies. Welcome to Cannabis Culture News Live with Jeremiah Vandermeer. Uh, Jeremiah is at Shambhalaya right now. He heard a rumor that there might be drug use there, and he's going to confirm it. Um, you know, we don't think that there's anything to that rumor, but uh, we'll, you know, when he comes back, he'll let us know for sure. So until then, um, I'm going to uh, read some of the news stories uh, to you from this week. And uh, later on, we'll have uh, an interview with Ganja Yoga founder, D. DeSalt. D, hi. Did I say that right? No, but it's how, how not How do you pronounce your name? It's Dusso. Dusso. D. Dusso. Okay. And that'll be a little later. Okay. So, uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start off with some uh, news stories. Uh, first off, in Arizona... Uh, a medical marijuana grower was shot and stabbed in a robbery, who was shot and stabbed in a robbery, could face charges. Police in Surprise, Arizona, are not ruling out the possibility of charges against a medical marijuana grower who was shot and stabbed inside his home Monday in a robbery attempt. Martin Ridgeway was in critical condition after being shot once in the abdomen and stabbed multiple times by one of the three men who came to his home compassion club posing as medical marijuana patients. As is the case with several aspects of Arizona's medical marijuana program, the legality of Ridgeway's setup is up in the air. According to court documents, Ridgeway's house had hundreds of marijuana plants as well as multiple packages of marijuana ready for sale. Selling marijuana isn't legal since licensed dispensaries aren't expected to open for another year, although Ridgeway apparently was running a compassion club in which suppliers typically offer up the medicine for free in exchange for donations for membership. The in investigation is ongoing at this time, surprise police, Sergeant Mike Donovan tells New Times. A specific quantity of plants was never mentioned. If during the course of the investigation it is determined that there are any violations of the law, the determination of charging would be considered at that time. So uh, our, our hearts go, go out to Ridgeway and hope he has a speedy recovery. And this news story is for Monday. I haven't seen anything uh, since, but uh, I, as soon as uh, I hear something, I will post it up uh, probably next week. Will do. <laughs> Greg just told me to slow down, so I'm a little nervous. It's alone in front of the camera, but <laughs> good idea. Hey, let's. Uh, so that was the first news story. I will light this up. I have a bong hit, almost ready. Uh, thank you, Tegan, for cleaning uh, the bong uh, bowl here for us. And. So I don't have a chat in front of me, but uh, hello to all of you in chat land and all of you who are watching and not in chat land, and all of you who will be watching in repeats. And of course, to the aliens. All right, back to the news. In Arizona again, the fight continues against uh, the medical marijuana law. This is from the Yuma Sun. Yuma Sun. Even as the Arizona Health Department awarded licenses Tuesday for medical marijuana dispensaries in Arizona, including three here in Yuma County, new legal ro roadblocks loomed. Arizona Attorney General Tom Horn announced Monday he will seek a court ruling to get dispensaries declared illegal since they cannot exist under federal drug laws. Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery is making a sim similar dispensaries challenge and may eventually go after individual medical marijuana users for breaking laws against illegal drugs. Horn argued a state law cannot overwrite federal law. He is correct unless that federal law is overturned. But it is an ironic argument since some state lawmakers and others have argued state authority can actually be superior to federal authority under our Constitution. The so-called states' rights claim has become a key argument on various issues in the state. 
The supremacy of the federal government on the marijuana issue has also been argued by most of the state's county attorneys and sheriffs as well. They have asked the governor to interfere, intervene against the medical marijuana law provisions approved by voters in 2010. But so far, Montgomery is the only one to actually take his own legal action. Well, uh, we can only hope that uh, nothing comes of this, but uh, it's, it's crazy why people would go against the, you know, uh, people's rights to use a plant as medicine unless you consider all the money in the pharmaceutical industry. <sighs> Sad. Uh, now, from Alternet, Inga Freikland offers us uh, this report on how legalizing drugs would stren strengthen democracy from Afghanistan to Mexico. The UN Office of Drug Control has thoroughly documented the violence, crime, and corruption linked with the worldwide heroin and opium trade. The U.S. news media report every day on the mayhem and corruption of government officials caused by the drug wars in Mexico, Colombia, and other points south of the U.S. border. In Afghanistan, the Taliban tax the opium trade and protect poppy far farmers from eradication, fueling the insurgency and our 11-year war. Well, the U.S. 11-year war. However, these problems are all consequences of drug prohibition, not the drugs themselves. In legal terms, drugs are malum prohibitum, wrong because they are prohibited by law, rather than malum in se, inherently wrong, such as theft or murder. During the U.S. experiment with prohibition, 1920 to 1933, alcohol was malum prohibitum, as soon as it was legalized, it again became a normal, regulated, tra traded, and taxed consumer product. We need to rethink our prohibition of drugs. What problem are we trying to solve by making drugs illegal? Have we chosen the most effective and affordable solution? Are the collateral, are the collateral consequences worth it? <clears throat> we should start with the premise that neither demand for drugs nor the drugs themselves can be eliminated. UNODC estimates the ultimate street value of drugs or originating in southern Afghanistan, primarily Helmand and Kandahar, as 68 billion. Where there is demand, there will be supply. If Afghan supplies were reduced, production would simply move elsewhere, as it did as it moved into Afghanistan in the 1980s after being pushed out of Southeast Asia's Golden Triangle. So there's another editorial on what you know, uh, any clear-headed thinker will tell you is that drug prohibition causes more harms, more deaths than the drugs themselves do. Um, this, the, I'm only reading you the parts of the stories because of uh, copyright issues. And if you want the uh, links to the rest of the stories, all these stories are on CannabisCulture.com. And you can find them on our page and uh, at the bottom of the stories, uh, the snippets of the stories, there will be links to the original articles so you can read more. Uh, okay, next. Hope everyone's doing well out there. A new bill could finally legalize hemp in the U.S. from Philip Smith at Alternet. A bipartisan group of senators has introduced a bill that would exclude industrial hemp from definition of marijuana. The bill, if passed, would get ar around the DEA's refusal to differentiate hemp from marijuana and could result in American farmers being allowed to grow the industrial crop. The bill Senate Bill 3501, was introduced last week by Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon, and co-sponsored by Senators Rand Paul, Republican from Kentucky, and Bernie Sanders, Independent from Vermont, and, Mike, and Jeff Merkley, uh, Democrat from Oregon. It would amend the Con Controlled Substances Act to make clear that hemp is not a drug even though it is part of the cannabis family. 
Hemp has much lower levels of THC than marijuana grown for recreational or medicinal purposes. And you can try getting high from hemp. Uh, you will just get a very bad headache. It seems to be the consensus. The Bill Marks widens a second attempt this year to get hemp delisted. He tried to offer an amendment to the Farm Bill. The Senate passed in June to do just that. But the Senate leadership ruled the amendment was not germane. I firmly believe that American farmers should not be denied an opportunity to grow and sell a legitimate crop simply because it resembles an illegal one, Wyden said. Raising this issue has sparked a growing awareness of exactly how ridiculous the U.S.'s ban on industrial hemp is. I'm confident that if grassroots support continues to grow and members of Congress, Congress continue to hear from voters, then common sense hemp legislation can move through Congress in the near future. Yeah, well, my comment on that, you know, you have what's supposed to be the bastion of democracy, and they can't even uh, legalize uh, one of the most useful crops in the world. That, you know, just a snapshot of America in 2012. Kind of expected more, didn't we? Um, all right. On next, uh, a caravan across the U.S. calls attention to the human impact of Mexico's drug war. This is from David Argan of the Catholic News Service. I'm not sure how to pronounce J-A-V-I-E-R. Javier Cecilia once wrote poetry inspired by Catholic mysticism, but traded his pen to work for justice and peace after the march 2011 murder of his son Juan Francisco, 24, whose body was stuffed with six others into a car near Surnavaca. Cecilia founded the Movement for Peace with Justice and Dignity, which has protested violence, impunity, and the unexpected consequences of the government crackdown on drug cartels and organized crime. Well, it's 4.20, everybody. I'm going to finish this story first before I take the toke because uh, it's not really uh, a moment to celebrate at the moment. We'll just, I'll just be silent and finish the story and then celebrate 420 after I... Uh, celebrate 420? Yeah. Okay, well, sorry guys. My phone went off. It's 420. You're right. I was overruled. So, but, uh, you know, I bow my head for those who have died in the drug war. Oh, it is bong hit time. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm going to take a bong hit now, and maybe I will convince D to take one later. <laughs> mm -mm. Oh, nice. Hey, a big shout out to Wave and Aftershock Phil, Dr. Dank. Zero, five cents, and Steel Town. Thanks a lot, guys. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope you guys are uh, celebrating as much as I'm just about to do. Yes, later Tippy will be on the show to discuss the different tra strains of catnip that are out there. <coughs> so back to the caravan across the U.S. drawing attention to the human impact of the Mexico's drug war. And after this story, I'll have you play the first video on the list, Greg. What? There's a list? There's a, yeah, I know, I know. Keep it simple, but I did my best. Truth? Yeah, I know the middle one. Justice, Justice and dignity. But after I finish this, I'll let you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. One second. So, Xavier Cecilia is also convinced caravans to the country's northern and southern borders, and pulled has also convened, sorry, convened caravans to the country's northern and southern borders and pulled no punches during public forums with politicians, including President Felipe Calderon, who told Cecilia that he had no regrets for cracking down on the country's drug cartels upon taking office in 2006. Mostly, though, Cecilia has given a voice to victims and their families, whose cases often go unsolved and who sometimes suffer from the stigmatization of having suspicions surround them and their loved ones were, that their loved ones were somehow mixed up in criminal activities. During the last six years, more than 50,000 lives have been lost. Thousands more simply disappeared. His complaint is much more than his son's case, said political analyst Jose Zapita. Uh, yes, another name I can't pronounce. Director of the online publication Sin Embargo. It's saying, enough. It's all about the victims. Cecilia now brings his movement north of the border, where the caravan for peace with justice and dignity will cross the United States. The trek begins August 12th in San Diego and is set up to conclude September 10th in Washington, stopping in 20 cities along the way. And if you check out CannabisCulture.com, uh, we have a picture of the map uh, that has a route of the car caravan. So, Greg, if you could snap that on for me. We'll be back in about five minutes. Enjoy this. The Movement for the Paz, Justice and Dignity invites all the Mexican organizations centroamericanas, norteamericanas, para que se unan a esta caravana en busca de una ruta de paz y de justicia para detener el sufrimiento que la guerra contra las drogas está causando tanto en Centroamérica como en México, como en los Estados Unidos. Esta guerra contra las drogas, los Estados Unidos han invertido en México dos mil millones de dólares. Por desgracia, la mayor parte de ese dinero se ha invertido en armas para el ejército y la policía, en logística militar. Alfredo Apodaca, Raúl Rascón, Miguel Ángel Mota. Luis Carlos Whitmar y Benjamín Levarón no debieron morir. Mado Avendaño Figueroa no debió morir. Joaquín García Jurado Carmona no debió morir. Y quiero decirle al señor presidente de la República, ¿sí? que él dijo, hay que sacrificar algo. Señor, a mí me hizo sacrificar tres hijos. necesario que esa lógica de seguridad nacional sea cambiada por una lógica de seguridad ciudadana y humana, donde los recursos se inviertan en la refundación de las instituciones que están muy corrompidas en México. Mi hijo fue desaparecido aquí en Chipancingo Guerrero por personas armadas que lo interceptaron a él y a otro amigo, lo subieron a unos yetas y desde entonces no sé de su paradero. Ya basta, ya basta. Somos miles y miles de familias que estamos pasando por este mismo dolor. Yajaira Guadalupe Baena López, 19 años de edad y fue sacada de la colula de Matamoros, Oaxaca. Hay muchas mujeres desaparecidas en Oaxaca. Día con día encuentran tres, cuatro mujeres decapitadas en Oaxaca. Como muerta o como viva. Quiero a mi hija de vuelta. Digan 
contéstenme, contéstenme. ¿Quién quiere estar en mis zapatos? ¿Quién quiere dormir? ¿Quién no puede dormir en las noches? No podemos dormir, no podemos comer, no podemos hacer nada. Mi hijo Juan Carlos no debió morir. Mi hija es Viviana Rayas. No debió morir. Hoy Durango, yo te invito. Te invito a que hagas conciencia porque hoy no te ha pasado. Pero quiero que voltees a tu alrededor y que pienses y que escuches el dolor del grito. Que me devuelvan a mi hijo, que me devuelvan a mi padre, que me devuelvan a mis hermanos. Y creo que todos nos preguntamos, pues, ¿dónde está el gobierno? ¿Dónde está la autoridad? ¿Dónde está la justicia? ¿Dónde está Dios? Creo que es tiempo de que nos empecemos a hacer otra pregunta. ¿Dónde estamos nosotros? 112 millones de mexicanos, ¿dónde estamos? Esa es la pregunta que necesitamos preguntarnos. En el tejido social que necesita ser fortalecido, en la educación, en la atención a los jóvenes y en el empleo. Sin ese camino vamos a andarnos en la violencia y en el dolor y no vamos a encontrar una verdadera seguridad y una verdadera paz. Hello and welcome back to Cannabis Culture News uh, with Maria Soska this week. Uh, so that was uh, some more information about the caravan. And uh, I'm just going to fill this, fill this up for Dee, who's going to come and join us soon after this last story, which is also not very happy, sadly. Dun, dun, dun. How's everybody's day going? Is everybody looking forward to the weekend? I know I sure am. <laughs> People in the room sure are. We're, we're really blessed with nice weather here in Vancouver. Okay. Mom says, is there a weekend? Is there a weekend? It's, well, it's always a weekend when we work here, but... <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Enjoy your work, though. Weekends suck? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just try to enjoy whatever you have to do, and then nothing will suck. That's my philosophy. So, I'm going to read one more story, and then uh, I'll continue with D. Mexico's drug death toll double what reported, expert argues from Fox News Latino, Andrew O'Reilly. The death toll in Mexico's bloody drug war has been hotly debated since outgoing presidents Felipe Calderón declared an offensive on the drug cartels back in 2006. The Mexican government, human rights group, and media argued over the actual body count until most media outfits finally settled on 50,000 as an approximate number for those killed in violence. However, a border and Latin American specialist in the New Mexico State University Library posits that the actual number is much high by almost double. Molly Malloy, a researcher at the New Mexico State University who maintains the Mexican news and discussion site Fonterra List, has kept a detailed record of the bloodshed and estimates the total homicides from December 2006 to June 2012 stand at 99,667, according to an article written by Malloy in the Phoenix New Times. Assuming that a similar rate of murder continues through the remaining months of this year, the homicide toll at the end of Calderon's presidency will add up to 110 61 victims. Oh, sorry, 110,061 victims, continued Malloy. The Mexican government, along with some media outlets, state that 90% of those killed in the violence in, involved in the drug trade. 
Malloy argues that out of those 10,800 plus victims killed in the border city of Ciudad Juarez since 2007, the vast majority of them had no involvement in the car cartels. With a population of only 1.2 million residents, Ciudad Juarez accounts for 10% of all Mexico's murder victims since 2007. So, as the drug war continues, people die for no reason. Uh, people are kept from their medicine for no reason. And uh, nobody trusts the government. Hmm. Whatever. But now for happier things. <laughs> Recently, uh, in Vancouver, um, a member, uh, a person from Toronto has moved. Uh, she, her name is Dee, and she... Uh, for three years, was in Toronto uh, doing uh, a program she called Ganja Yoga. And I'll, I'll let her come on right now and tell, tell you more about what it is and uh, what she's all about. Hey, how are you, Dee? Good. How are you? Good. Good, Good. to see you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I've been to a couple of the startup yoga sessions, and I really enjoyed it. Um, let, but uh, I don't really know exactly what it is. So why don't you tell me exactly what um, uh, Ganja Yoga is, and um, we'll go from there. Okay, cool. So Ganja Yoga is, you know, it's a it's yoga practice, all a bunch of different kinds of yoga mm -hmm. practices from mm -hmm. the Hatha tradition. And Hatha mm -hmm. Yoga is um, the kind of the basics, the conventional postures and breathing, with the idea to balance the body and the mind mm -hmm. um, to achieve mm -hmm. states of peace and relaxation liberation from oh. suffering. So um, we, nice. we do Hatha Yoga and we enhance it with cannabis, mm -hmm. which also has um, relaxation effects, bliss-inducing effects, and also mm. reduces suffering. So if we take these two paths that sh reduce suffering and do them together, then I think we're doubling our chances. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> definitely. I definitely know that, that when I get stoned, um, it's, it's a body sensation besi besides my mind. Well, because I'm, I'm pretty chronic, uh, it's mostly a body sensation now. <laughs> my, you know, my mind. You, you, when you when you're chronic, you you find ways to to be normal, regardless. And uh, the stone being stone doesn't really screw you up as much as it does uh, when you're a, a newbie. I'm still a newbie. So, I'm still a total cannabis newbie. You're, you're so still a definitely, cannabis newbie. Yeah. So just six, a little bit. Six total, years. Yeah. You know, it's, still, it's pretty. It's pretty new. And yeah. Well, we'll I'm save the bong token, token until after the interview. Then. That's what uh, I was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> just, so just we're a, a little bit more coherent. <laughs> yeah, once, early in a ganja yoga class, these students gave me some honey oil, which I'd never had before. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, and it was pretty early on, so I was even more of a lightweight. And at one point, after smoking it, the, one, someone in the class was like, are we supposed to be following you? Because I was just like, uh, like I don't even know. I don't know what I was doing. I, was on, I, was, I felt like I was astral traveling. I actually saw swirling Ganesh. So I thought I was like reaching some nirvana. I, I don't know. It's, you po probably it's, were. Perhaps. Perhaps I was. Wow. So, so um, uh, did you uh, come up with this idea yourself, or has has anybody done have mixed marijuana and yoga before? In the yoga community, marijuana in the contemporary yoga community, mm -hmm. marijuana is not really so accepted. Mm -hmm. There's an idea that you know yoga practice is about attaining purity of body and mind, so that we can go to these sort of nirvana places of bliss and relaxation. Mm -hmm. So, so, so conventional, like vegan, and, vegan and that, that raw, sort of yeah, maybe you know. Um, decreasing how much stimulation you have, you know, more and more gentle music or maybe not, no, no media, you know, this, this ascetic kind of yeah, idea. Very purity. good suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, so I advocate. People don't think of them past, as yeah. suggestions, more yeah, commands, and that's, exactly. that's where people get into. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yours, yours is, you, you don't uh, in, make people smoke cannabis then? No, it's not requisite. Is? No, it's still no, a really great yoga class. I mean, I, I feel uh -huh. good teaching it and people seem to like it, so it's, it's a cannabis <laughs> optional class. The way at Rec Beach, it's a clothing optional. It's on a nude beach, you know. You it's can, on a nude beach. Okay, you can so choose you your own adventure, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, so you've been doing it for three years in Toronto. Uh, why don't you? Would you mind telling us uh, how how you got started and uh, what your experiences there were? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I feel it's awkward to look into the camera. Do I? Uh, is that a rec? Is that a uh, yeah. In the end, you'll probably wish that you'd look, okay. look into the camera. Okay, it's a good and, It's and, a meditation. And, and, and yeah, the camera. Okay. It's we're we're on a stage. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're, okay. We're doing real life. 
Put on a stage. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. So yoga practice any anytime, any place. So yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, three years ago, I uh, was finishing my yoga teacher training, and uh, a month after I finished it, I decided to open a yoga studio, which was maybe a little bit, uh, I guess, yeah, it was tenacious, you know, kind of ambitious. I uh -huh. opened it from my house, um, and I had just got into cannabis maybe two, three years before that. So I'd been doing yoga for about 16 years, uh -huh. um, but a pretty noob to the, the world of cannabis. And when I started smoking, I actually got into more of the ideas of like, you know, mysticism and metaphysical stuff. I was reading Alan Watts and kind of, I don't know, smoking cannabis kind of decreased my super academic, you know, sci rational mind, just kind of yes. quiet it. Of, of course, it's not yeah. gone forever. No. But just in those moments, it kind of just allowed me to sink into other possibilities. And so yes. then I started doing yoga with it, and it, was ju it just felt like it took me much more deep into my yoga practice. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 When I was in college, um, whenever I smoked met, uh, marijuana, cannabis, I got deep fits of artistic creativity. And uh, I tried being artistic and creative without smoking the cannabis, and uh, it just would not come. So I, I accepted it into my life then. Uh, well, I, when I was younger, I always fought with it, but now I realize that it's, some, it's something that is actually completely positive. Yeah, I think there's, there's lots of different tools to the, mount, to the mountaintop. You mm -hmm. know, and at different times in our lives, we, uh, we use different tools. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying that cannabis is my only tool or it's going to mm -hmm. be the tool till the day I die. I, I can't say anything about That's the future. True. Just mm -hmm. right now, this, this combination of practices works for me and it seems to work for my students. They seem nice. to really enjoy combining the two, and especially because the environment is really one where if you've never done yoga before, you, you know, you, you're more of the, on the cannabis side of things mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the classes are a bit more about the mindfulness. You really don't mm -hmm. have to get mm -hmm. into these contorted postures and you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what, what we usually think of, in yo of yoga in contemporary yoga, mm -hmm. you know, with all these different kinds of you know, shoulder stands and things. But mm -hmm. ganja yoga is much more about just uh, feeling relaxed, finding the bliss, the, the quiet bliss of relaxation and seeing if you can take that sensation with you off the mat and into your world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for for me, I find that uh, the stretching, I go there for the stretching so that my body stretches and, and it's it's healthier that way. The muscles don't cramp up and I, it's uh, it's definitely not about the cannabis. It's definitely about the yoga and the physicians and, and the, the way I feel during and afterwards. You know, I feel just much more healthy and, and invigorated. Uh, Easier to climb stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's not. It's not just about the cannabis. It's. It's. It's the combination, really. And um, you know, I, I said that people don't have to smoke. And you know, once someone came and they didn't know what ganja meant, so they showed up for the class thinking it was like a Bikram and an Iyengar. <laughs> well, ganja. It sounds kind of Sanskrit. Let's go. So, they, and they didn't smoke. They just stayed for the class, but they really enjoyed it as well. So. You know, you don't have to smoke it, but on the other hand, even if you're not, like I've done things where even if you don't want to smoke, I have a jar of really beautiful, organic, you know, homegrown. Mm -hmm. I, get, I get them to put their pinky finger into the ganja mm -hmm. and do a little bit of like an interactive meditation to just still to have that honor, honor to the plant, to the oh, plant yeah. medicine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's excellent. And so uh, how was the reception uh, in Toronto? And, and, and I'll just pause you for a second. Does anybody have a lighter or can somebody pass me that black lighter there? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, how was the reception from Torontoites? It was great. Yeah, yeah. It, it was like you know, slow starting. I didn't have a budget at all, and I was doing it like you know, a month after graduating yoga teacher training out of my house. Um, so the first couple of classes, maybe one, uh, the very first class, zero people came, um, mm -hmm. but I had an amazing practice, and so that was awesome. Um, but then slowly, two, three, it spread. Like I had no, there was, it was just Facebook and word of mouth. But by the, right. when I left just two months ago, there were 30 people in every class. So, you know, that's, it spread really, really amazingly in three years. That's really nice. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. And so um, now you're uh, here in Vancouver and you met up with, with us here at Cannabis Culture. And I understand you've come to some agreement with Jody recently. Uh, to teach in our building, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, we did, been, we did. I've been to a couple of the test classes. Yeah, and they were really good. And it looks like it's so uh, it looks like it's going to be permanent here. So t tell us a little bit more about uh, 
that and uh, your plan plans for uh, the future. Cool. So yeah, right now we have uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And then we made the times a bit varied so that we could kind of try to find the perfect wake and bake time for everyone. So Tuesdays are at 10, Thursdays are at 11, and Sundays are at 12. So choose, choose, choose your best time. Um, and I'm hoping for some more times in the future, you know. And um, in Toronto, I was doing them at like a diff- cool like bohemian art gallery type spaces. And yeah, um, these rich women hired me for a bachelorette party uh-huh. to come to their hotel. And like before they went out on the town, we did a ganja yoga session. So um, and different friends at their loft spaces. And so you know, kind of just like spreading the ganja yoga like a queen bee, kind of pollinating it all over. Right. Yeah. Right. So so basically, uh, you can you can come down and, and join our, our uh, ganja yoga session here at BCMP, or you can get in touch with us, and we'll get we'll get you an email soon from Cannabis Culture, and okay. then people can contact you directly. Nice. Um, and she can she's available for uh, you know personal sessions or parties or or whatever you need uh, a ganja yoga uh, <laughs> instructress for. So, uh, how, how much how much does it cost uh, to join? Uh, I decided to make the uh, scale sliding so that we could you know really because it's I think yoga should be for everyone. So um, oh. uh, the go the I think I don't even know in Vancouver, but the market rate for a class in Toronto is fifteen. So somewhere right. in that range is suggested, but really it's on a it's on a sliding scale based on your um, income and your yeah what you need yeah right Mm -hmm. on so um, (laughs) it's I believe the address at our lounge is uh, 303 West Hastings is that right Greg 303 West Hastings so if you're if you're in second floor if you're in Vancouver on Tuesdays at 10 Thursdays 11 or Sundays at 12 uh, feel free to come on in. Yeah, and, there's mats. Uh, we have mats. And I, I, I'm snacks. going to be a regular member. I, yeah. <laughs> cool. And uh, so I'll see you there, and you'll be instructed by the wonderful Dee. <laughs> so now, uh, would you mind t- taking a bong hit in front of the camera? <laughs> Just my arm. Uh, <laughs> Earlier he asked me, and I was like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, everybody me. says yes in the end. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody, but... Most people do. So I might need some assistance with this, yeah. So okay, it's, it's a big bong here. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I have to uh, say, I'm, yeah. Down, uh, here, I'll pass this to other people. I also like to advocate for vaporizing and consuming it orally, <laughs> like <laughs> eating it and drinking it <laughs> for yogic reasons. Yeah, you know, vaporizing is not smoke. Yeah, it's so. Okay. And so that it's a lot healthier to take it that way. Earlier when you were talking about like purity and the ascetic path, uh, you know, yes. I think like the true tantric path would to be to include those as well. Like you want to kind of be mindful of all of your choices, you know, and sort of that, find that beautiful right. balance that works for you. That's you right. Know? So you pr- you prefer to vaporize during the yoga sessions, even though you will you will you will smoke a joint or, right. or yes. get a bong pass. As yes, you that's right. Demonstrate. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. I'm not rigidly attached to anyone. No, no. It's like like the ascetic life is is definitely a suggestion and not a command. Yeah, so, that's right. Okay, cool. So, See. So here we are. Okay. So yeah. So. Okay. Uh, what up? Okay. First, get a, get a good. I'll hold on to it. Okay. Get a good. I'll, I'll do this as well. What you want to do is it's it's a two-stage thing. Okay. So first, we're going to burn it and fill up the chamber. Then you're going to exhale, and then you're going to in, inhale I okay. a whole breath. This I'll, seems like uh, a lot. It's yeah, maybe there's a little too much. I'll just take a little bit out, just, just because it's your first time. Remember the honey oil story? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so that, you that, said that'll do it. So inhale. Just inhale. Yep. And then when you, when you think you've had a big enough inhale, remember you're going to... Smoke the same amount of smoke as you inhale, so take as much of a breath as you feel comfortable breathing again full of smoke. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, here we go. Go. Now, exhale. Okay. It's actually quite cool. No big, no big deal. We'll yeah. see, we'll see. It's not killing me. I might need some help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll finish it up. Finish it up. Awesome. <sighs> yeah, believe me, uh, when I started here, I guess over a year ago, I coughed every time I tried to use this thing. Uh, so this is twice. <laughs> That's uh. 
I haven't really coughed very much, just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so that's our news program. Uh, I have one more video there, Greg. If you could just cue that up, please. Um, thank you very much, Dee, for coming and uh, <laughs> talking to uh, me and everybody there about your yoga. I hope to see uh, as many uh, Vancouver people out there as, I c as uh, possible to see her or uh, talk to her. For now, uh, you can email marius at cannabisculture.com uh, if you have any messages for Dee, and we'll get her another email address soon. So until then, uh, if you're camping, you might have to watch out for uh, a certain type of spider. Uh, Greg, could you flip that on? So I'll see you next week, and uh, have a great weekend. <laughs>